I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. All right, my friends, before we get into today's episode, I want to invite you to a really powerful online workshop that I'm hosting very soon. So if you are anything like me, I bet that you want to be a rock star working mom. And in order to feel like one, you have to find some way to get all the things done at work and at home and still have some time for yourself. But the problem is you already have too much to do and not enough time to do it, and it's flat out exhausting. You might even be worried that this is as good as it gets, that exhaustion just kind of is what it is for a really busy mom. Well, I think you deserve to have someone in your corner who has been where you are and who really knows how to help you fit everything important into your life and still have some room to breathe. As an entrepreneur with a husband and three kids of my own, I know exactly how it feels to have too much to do and not enough time to do it. It's exhausting. It's stressful. And honestly, it can feel hopeless. That's why I had to find a way to get my life in order so all the pieces would fit and I could still get a good night's sleep and some time for myself. It wasn't easy, but what I discovered has helped me and thousands of other women reclaim rock star status over the last 10 years. And now it's your turn. I am unpacking this three-step process in Three Steps to Rockstar Status, my private online workshop for working moms. First, we'll get you energized. Then we'll teach you to be more productive. And third, we'll show you how you can feel truly fulfilled by your life. We're kicking it off on March 16th in a private pop-up Facebook group where I'll be sharing all my best tips and tricks in a series of live broadcasts. The whole workshop is totally free, so grab your spot today and get on the path to rockstar status. It's at SherylannSkolnicki.com forward slash rockstar workshop. I'll see you there. Okay, so today I have a question for you. Do you ever worry that you work too much? I know I question this a lot because the truth is I just love my work and it would be easy to do it all the time. Sometimes, sadly, even at my husband's expense or my children's expense because it feels like play to me and it's so connected to my purpose. But I think it's true that anytime we find some sort of one-sidedness in our life, it's worth examining to understand what's going on there. What are our motivations? What's maybe the pattern we aren't aware of yet? And importantly, what are some potential dangers that might exist in that pattern? So today, I want to help you think about the way you work, how much and how intensely, and see if you want to make any adjustments. So we're going to do three things. We're going to define what it means to be a workaholic today, and then to help you assess your own behavior and see why you work so much, and finally, give you some ideas about how you could work less without inducing panic, okay? So first up, you might be wondering, you know, am I a workaholic? Is that a, a, is that a label that I need to wear or a term that resonates with me? I'll be honest, it's not a term that really resonated with me because I think it it has such a negative connotation, and it feels maybe a little dated. Like that particular term feels like maybe it was something that was really prevalent in the 80s or 90s, around the same time that like type A personality was really trending. And now I think we've moved on to other ways of describing the same behaviors. So if you're recoiling a little bit from the term workaholic, stay with me here. I'm going to give you a series of seven questions that researchers say if you identify, um, if you answer yes or you agree with more than half of these statements, it's probably a pattern of work that you want to explore. So here they are. The first question is you think of how you can free up more time to work. Like you're always plotting, right? How you can get more time allocated to work. 
Second, you spend much more time working than you initially intended. It sort of bleeds over past the initial time you'd allocated to work. Three, you work in order to reduce feelings of guilt or anxiety or helplessness or depression. In other words, you're using work as a kind of medicine. It's it's helping you numb out other feelings. Four, you have been told by others to cut down on work and you haven't listened to them. Five, you get stressed if you're prohibited from working. If something gets in the way of you doing work, it stresses you out. Six, you deprioritize hobbies, leisure activities, and or exercise because of your work. And seven, you work so much that it has negatively influenced your health. So the question is, are you squirming a little as you listen to those seven questions? I know I was. And those seven questions are the indicator that you probably work a lot and maybe have a little less control over the situation than you think. The formal definition of workaholism is feeling compelled to work because of internal pressures. It's a self-guided, self-directed force toward working. In other words, this is not about having a demanding boss, right? You can't blame someone else. It's really an internal mechanism driving you to work. And having persistent thoughts about work while not working. So you've heard me talk on the podcast before about cognitive load or mental burden. So when work is something that you're thinking about, you're spinning on, even when you're not working, that's what this second piece means, right? Persistent thoughts about work when not working. And third, working beyond what is reasonably expected despite the potential for negative consequences. Those three things kind of fit into like the Webster's definition of workaholism. And the seven questions, I think, are a little bit of a softer way to self-assess, is this an issue for you? So I want you to ask yourself, just take a beat, take a breath here and ask yourself, where do you fall? If you recognize yourself in this pattern, I think it's worth exploring why. And so I put some thought into what are some of the reasons that you might find yourself working a lot, okay? It's not always negative. Sometimes working a lot is really driven by the fact that you just love your work. And that actually has a different clinical term. Clinically speaking, we would call that work engagement. It has a more positive set of associations with it than workaholism, right? Which has a lot of negative associations and consequences. But that is the first thing that could cause you to work a lot, maybe beyond the the boundaries of what's practical. And, And it's pleasure, right? You might be seeking pleasure. You just love the actual work. It feels like playtime to you. It's become a hobby. So if you love your work so much that you wake up thinking about what you get to do that day. And you don't want to stop at the end of the day because you love it so much. That sounds a lot like a child at play. You know, a child will wake up in the morning excited to start playing, whatever it is, whatever their favorite thing to play is, right? Maybe they love Barbie dolls. Maybe they love to go outside and play soccer. Whatever it is, they would do it all day. They would skip meals. They would stay up past their bedtime to get to keep doing it. So if that's how work feels to you, then what you're really seeking in the work is pleasure. And so in the same way that we would have a child mitigate their playtime so that they can do other things, we need to think about how do we mitigate our work time. Okay, that's the first piece. The second thing you might be seeking is money. And this can be very literal, like there can be a linear correlation. If you are an hourly employee or you are an entrepreneur who charges by the hour, the more time you work, the more money you will make. And so this is where you might hear people picking up additional shifts, right? I can remember back in high school being a waitress and wanting to pick up additional shifts because I knew I could make more money. It was very exciting to think about having control over that. As an entrepreneur, sometimes we're chasing more money. So working more, there's a belief, sometimes it's literal, correlated to more money, and sometimes it's 
there's just a, a soft correlation. There's a belief that if we work more, right, the business will be make bigger and we'll make more money. Or if we're working in a corporate job, that if we work more, we'll get promoted and that will bring more money. So that's the second thing that you might be chasing if you're really working a lot. And you want to be honest with yourself about what is underneath the desire to work so much. The third thing you might be chasing is a feeling. You may want to feel productive or competent. So this is where, you know, whether you call it type A personality, you call it being an overachiever, if you know the Enneagram, you call it being an Enneagram 3, right? It's that that drive to achieve, to feel productive, to get things done. And chasing that feeling can cause you to work a lot. So the desire to feel productive or competent can become like a drug. And working more gives you more of that. I thought a lot about the fourth one. I think there's a feeling that in modern times, a lot of us are chasing people who work a lot of feeling caught up. You know, wanting to feel like, okay, everything on my to do list is done. I've checked all the boxes and I've sort of earned the right to relax. The challenge today is it is really rare, especially if you're doing high-level work, to ever get fully caught up. There's just always more coming at you. There's always more that could be done. So that chasing that feeling of being caught up is a bit like you know Don Quixote chasing windmills. I'm not sure that it's real, that we'll ever really achieve that, but I think it's a very powerful driver for some of us. Hey friend, ever wondered why you're so tired all the time? Why you need that afternoon caffeine hit every day just to stay in the game? Hint, you probably need more sleep. So I created something just for you. It's a special guide to help you stop feeling so tired all the time. I'll teach you my best ideas to move from exhausted to energized so you can live out your brilliant dreams. Head to brilliantbalance.net forward slash sleep and get your guide today. You're going to love this. The fifth thing you might be seeking if you work a lot is a sense of control. And this is that pattern of, I have to do it my way, right? If I don't do it myself, it won't be done right. And that can cause us to not delegate, not ask for help, not outsource, because we think there's a standard that we have to achieve that only we can do. So if you are running a team at work and you have people that you could pass work on to, right, and and supervise or coach them through doing that work, and you're not, and therefore you're working extra hours, you want to examine, is that about the desire for a sense of control? That's true whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're working in a corporate job. And honestly, it's true at home. You know, in some sometimes we can move our tendency to overwork from the paid environment straight through to our home environment. And we can have, we can be doing all the time at home because of that desire for a sense of control. We can't let anyone help us. They won't do it right. And then the sixth one is that you might be seeking a hiding place. You know, work can become a refuge, a place to avoid other, maybe more uncomfortable or less controlled situations. So maybe your marriage isn't going so great. Maybe there's a tough patch with the kids and and what they ask of you feels really demanding. Maybe your home isn't in the order that you want it to be, right? Maybe you don't have a lot of friends and going home causes you to confront that. So work can become a numbing place, a hiding place in the same way that any other addiction can, in the same way that someone you know over shops or overeats or over drinks, we can overwork as a way to avoid other more uncomfortable emotions or feelings or situations. So think back through that list, you know, pleasure, you just love the actual work, money, feeling productive or feeling competent, feeling caught up, having a sense of control, or having a hiding place, a refuge from other situations in your life. 
and ask yourself which one may be driving your personal pattern of overworking. And then I want you to ask yourself if you think you'd benefit from working less. Is there something in your life that might get better, that might strengthen, that might grow if you had less time at work and more time doing other things? And the answer is probably yes. For most people who are agreeing with, you know, this this definition of workaholic or overworking and you're recognizing yourself in the pattern, And if you're able to identify what really is the driver, then the antidote is like finding another way to meet that need, okay? So let's, let's look at two of them. You really get so much pleasure from work, right, that it's become your hobby, or you feel so productive at work that you don't really want to give up that feeling of productivity. Let's just look at those two. In either case, broadening your definition of productive or broadening your definition of fun gives you some ease. It gives you a way to transition out of this very narrow definition of what meets, you know, kind of scratches that itch or meets that need into something a little broader. So most psychologists would agree that it's really important for type A personalities or overachievers to have some kind of an outlet outside of their work. And that means when you're wrapping up work, you kind of know what you're going to be doing instead, and that can make it feel safer. So when you broaden your definition of what is productive or what is fun, here are some examples, like taking a lesson, right, or taking a class. So learning how to do something new. Maybe you take a guitar lesson or a painting class, or you take lessons in a foreign language, or you learn to write computer code right? Any of those things, could they're sort of pseudo-productive, right? They don't feel the same as just pure leisure. And so they can sort of be a step-down plan from work to leisure. Does that make sense? Another example would be volunteer work. So volunteering can feel productive or it can feel fun, in a way that's like a step-down plan from work. Completing a project at home, You know, tackling a project, maybe it's a small renovation project that you're going to do yourself. Maybe it's a decorating project. Maybe it's organizing something. Maybe it's planning a vacation. But it feels productive because something is still getting accomplished and it's not work. So redefining your, you know, broadening your definition of productive or of fun is going to help you create a step down plan out of your work, your traditional work, into leisure. It's like a halfway point, okay? Leisure really matters. By the way, I'm not in any way suggesting that we shouldn't have our eyes on the prize there, but it really can be too abrupt of a switch for a workaholic. It can almost feel kind of scary at first. So that's the first idea. The second idea is to plan meetups. Plan meetups. So think about you know, your own behavior. People who overwork tend to be very responsible, right? We're sort of like the good girls. We get the things done. We keep our commitments. We don't want to let anybody down. So when someone is counting on you outside of work, you're far more likely to do the thing to, because you want to keep that commitment. So your motivator may not be the actual activity. Your motivator is the commitment to someone else. So if you find that you're working late, even when you said you wouldn't, or you're going in on the weekends, even when you said you wouldn't, it's probably time to make a commitment to someone else and plan a meetup. It could be for coffee. It could be to go for a walk, right? You could meet someone for dinner or for drinks or for lunch, but having an oper- a planned time, a scheduled time where someone else is counting on you to do something, it could be taking your child to the trampoline park, right? Which my children would do every single day if I would do it. So planning something that you've made the commitment, they're counting on you, you said you would be there, can help you get yourself out of work and into that next activity. So that's the second thing. And the third idea I would share is to set firm limits on work hours 
specifically to force prioritization. So I think if I started here and said, well, it's really simple. You just have to have you know, a time that you leave work. That, that's not really practical, right? But if you think about the other two, which give you the why, why are you setting a limit on work? So that you can go home and either meet someone or you can go home and transition into one of these other pseudo-productive, pseudo-fun activities, right? Then you start to have a little bit of more space, a little bit more openness to the idea of setting limits on work hours. So here's what I mean by a limit. Setting a start time, like I will not roll out of bed and immediately start working, and an end time. This is the time I'm going to pack up my things and leave my workstation, whether you work from home or a coffee shop or an office or wherever, this is the time when it's over. You may need to set limits on weekends, you know, what or or your days off. What are the what are the hours that you will not be working? And here's the really cool thing that happens when you set those limits. You have to figure out what to do with the overflow. Because remember that feel chasing that feeling of being caught up or that feeling, you know, of everything on my to-do list is done, that's what'll kill you here. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have said, all right, it's 5.30 and I'm, I'm going to pack it up. But if I just stayed a little bit later, I could get these three things done. And it would feel so good to have them checked off my list. So what has to happen to set these limits is learning to live with the undone. Learning to live with that discomfort of something being on your list and not yet finished. Right? Otherwise, you're chasing that feeling, chasing it relentlessly, and it's never going to come. Instead, when you create a zone for work and then you stick to it, right? you force the work to fit inside that zone, you will ruthlessly prioritize. You will naturally get the most important things done first. Over time, this won't happen immediately, but you'll get the most important things done first. They're more leveraged. And you will learn to delegate or to outsource because you'll quickly see that that's the way to increase your throughput, right? That's the way to get more things accomplished within each 24-hour day. Not you burning the midnight oil, but leveraging teams, leveraging your family, leveraging you know the entire economy, really, that can be in service to you to get this work done. And it's hard when you are accustomed to carrying it all on your shoulders. I can empathize more than I'd like to admit, but it is so powerful when you create this limit that forces you to make choices. And you will be amazed when you learn that the world keeps spinning on its axis, even when everything is not done well in advance, right? It's a beautiful thing to learn and it will change your life week by week, month by month, as you start to adopt this practice. I hope that gives you some freedom. I hope that that creates a little bit of space for your mind to explore what another way of working might look like. It's not all or nothing, but make some kind of gentle shift starting today and see if you can create more joy. See if you can create a sense of being more fully present with the people in your life by doing so. All right, next time on the podcast, I am talking to Jill Yavorsky. She's awesome, y'all. She is an expert in gender dynamics, and we are talking about how contemporary couples divide work at home. It is so good. I've pre-recorded this episode. I can tell you you're going to love it. We have this fantastic discussion. She's so fun, and she has all the data to back up what you've probably already been feeling. So don't miss that one. Also, like I talked about at the beginning today, remember to register for Three Steps to Rockstar Status. That's my private online workshop for working moms. We're starting on March 16th. So jump in there now, grab your free spot, and we will get you the reminder right before we get started on March 16th. The details are all in the show notes. Till next time, my friends, let's be brilliant.
This is the podcastfactory.com.